Okay. Okay, so we're gonna get started. Um, yeah, so a reminder for people joining online, uh, we have the question and answer feature enabled on the Zoom call. So if you have a question, uh, raise your hand and type a, type something into the Q&A. And we have moderators here who will try to either unmute you or um, ask the question for you. Correct. They don't need to raise their hand. The Q&A will tell us they have a question. Oh, okay. So you don't need to raise your hand. Uh, just type into the Q&A. Um, just mention that you have a question um, and type a short summary. Um, <clears throat> the second thing is uh, in terms of uh, the, the plan for the rest of the course. So I think we're actually going to do three lectures next week. So we'll do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday again next week, just to give us time to go over um, to go over all of the topics that we want to get to. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we're finishing up with the quantum field theory, the discussion of uh, sort of von Neumann algebras for quantum field theory. So the focus next week will be first talking about uh, how you incorporate gravi gravity into the story, um, in particular talking about constraints and gravity. And then from there, we'll be going to how you apply that to the algebraic framework we've been developing. Okay, so we're gonna continue now with the, our discussion of algebras in quantum field theory. So last time we briefly started talking about this bisignano wigman theorem. And so just to state what the, the theorem is, um, the goal is to show that the Minkowski vacuum restricted to the Rindler wedge um, W, which was the sort of the right side of Minkowski spacetime, and is thermal with respect to the boost. And so this, this characterization as being thermal is sort of the physics way of saying uh, this property. And this was um, you know, identified by Unruh, where he was uh, looking at the uh, properties of you know, particle detectors that are going undergoing uniform acceleration. And so that's this bisignano wigman theorem is kind of closely related um, and intertwined with the Unruh effect. Um, and as Ted pointed out, I think this path integral derivation we're giving is originally due to Unruh and Weiss. Um, so from the algebraic perspective, what the theorem actually is, is that um, they're trying to compute the modular operator for the Minkowski vacuum um, for the algebra restricted to the Rindler wedge. And so the idea, what we're trying to show is that this modular operator for the vacuum for the Rindler wedge is um, thermal with respect to the boost generator. So the modular Hamiltonian is proportional to the boost generator. This is just the thing that generates forward time evolution that we've got. Rindler wedge, it's the thing that generates the forward time evo evolution on the right wedge and backwards time evolution on the left wedge. And so this is this full boost generator you integrated over a complete Cauchy surface here. Um, and so the way we're planning on doing this is to use this formal uh, split in the modular operator. So we're going to be trying to compute the density matrix for the right side and showing that it's equal to the right part of the boost generator. So this is just, if you restrict the integral to the positive um, x-axis here. Okay. <clears throat> um, and so after we do the path integral derivation, I'll give a few comments on how you um, are supposed to do this without assuming the factorization of the modular operator. Okay. So the, the trick, the one of the nicest ways to get this result is to employ the Euclidean path integral as a way to represent the vacuum state in Minkowski space. Um, so if you're familiar with Euclidean path integrals, you kind of think of it as um, doing the path integral. Of, so you're, you go to Euclidean space, you do this, you're um, analytically continuing space time to imaginary time. And so now everything looks just like Euclidean here. And you're, oh yeah, um, and um, you're you're doing this path integral, which essentially does an infinite amount of Euclidean time evolution to the path of this uh, p equals zero slice. Um, what that does is it tends to damp out. If you start with an arbitrary stage, it kind of damps out any um, sort of. Uh, 
any component of that state that overlaps with an excited state. And when you normalize things, you're left only with the vacuum. So it's sort of the path integral kind of projects onto the vacuum state. Um, and this is uh, this is closely related. I guess it's important for this argument that the Hamiltonian generating this time evolution is positive as well. So that ends up being an input into the bising on a Wigman theorem uh, derived in other ways as well. Okay, so the, the Euclidean path integral representation of the vacuum state, um, you're going to do a path integral over the lower half imaginary time plane. Um, and what, what happens here is that you, you're thinking of this as a functional of the boundary condition that you're putting at the t equals zero slice. So you pick some profile for your fields um, on this slice that's some sort of wave functional for them. And the path integral really tells you sort of the number that it roughly kind of tells you the overlap with the, the phi minus state um, where that just tells you the wave functional there. So similarly, the so that's kind of for the, the ket. The bra is prepared in a similar manner, except you do the path integral over the upper half plane. And so then we'll denote the, the boundary condition in the path integral is phi plus here. Um, and so then that's the state where your wave functional at the t equals zero slice is just given by the phi plus profile. And so the density matrix, you just do the standard picture where you say, okay, for the global state, you just form the density matrix as the, the bra and ket put together like this. Um, and then you're going to do the standard thing where if you want the density matrix for the right wedge, you trace out all of the fields, um, all of the states on the of fields localized on the left side. So what this trace means is that you want to identify the wave function on the left here for the this state with the wave function on the left here. And so you think of that as just gluing those two states together there and integrating over all possible boundary conditions on the left side. So then you represent this as a path integral over the full plane where you have a cut here and you're still allowing the bottom boundary condition on the cut to be different from the top boundary condition because then this is now an operator basically that tells you this density matrix for, for this side. So that's saying you didn't trace out over on the right hand side here. <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to try to use this picture in terms of the cut plane to argue for what this density matrix restricted to the right means. So for this setup, um, what the what drawing it like this is that okay, you view this as an operator mapping kind of a state specified on the top here, the state on the bottom. And you can think of this as an evolution in Euclidean time where instead of you know evolving to the past or the future, you're now evolving sort of from the top half of the cut to the bottom half of the cut. And so, yeah, redrawing the cut here, you kind of think about slicing your path integral now in an angular foliation and kind of composing, saying the operator that you're computing is the one that's gen generating this rotation um, in the cut plane here. <clears throat> so in particular, if you just did um, the path integral just over a wedge of angle alpha, um, between an initial and final wave function, you just want to think of this as an operator in your theory. And again, it just maps, it maps uh, field configurations on the initial to the field configurations on the final slice. So this corresponds to some operator that we can call O of alpha. Um, and to identify what this is, you can imagine um, increasing the angle alpha by a small amount and asking how this operator changes. So roughly what happens, okay, yeah. So when you when you 
do a small increase in the path integral like that, you implement that basically by inserting a stress tensor into the path integral. So you can say something like d by d alpha O of alpha is represented by um, by a path integral d phi e to the minus i phi. But this small change in the path integral essentially brings down a stress tensor, and we'll write that as inserting an operator k alpha um, kind of at the end, just on this little uh, infinitesimal piece of, that we're adding here. So as an operator, since we've added this sort of on at the end of the path integral, this corresponds to just multiplying by this operator k alpha of the original operator O alpha on the left. So, so somebody in Zoom just asked to clarify, because it's hard to read what the uh, boundary conditions are on the path integral for row W. Uh, okay, sorry about that. So um, so I just wrote the, the field um, on the bottom here corresponds with phi minus. Maybe I should just, I don't know if the camera's on me on that side, but yeah, yeah. okay. Let me just draw those a bit bigger. So you do phi plus on this side and phi minus on this side. But those are just the boundaries. So roughly that's what I'm just drawing here is do those boundary conditions on the, those two slices. I don't have a great notation, so it's uh, <laughs> it's something like that. Um, well, could you put a subscript R so that because previously you used phi plus for the entire function? Oh, I see. Well, okay, yeah. So this is just the right part. I mean, yeah. This is the right part of the wedge. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So as I mentioned, that th this operator that implements sort of a you think of it's kind of as a diffio of the, the region you're integrating over. You're sort of changing the metric just here to integrate over a, a greater region of the plane. Um, this is expressed as the integral of a stress tensor, and it's sort of the thing generating this rotation here. So you write the k of alpha um, is equal to the integral over sigma of alpha. So this this plane that you're um, adding the extra part of the path integral to, we'll call this sigma of alpha. It's sort of the thing going here of um, T A B C B say B sigma A. So C in this case is just the vector that's pointing to the new um, the new slice that you're going to. So for example, in in this case, we're doing a rotation in Euclidean space. So C is just equal to say the rotation generator. So R, the radial distance times the angular. Um, so, so phi hat, so sort of the angular unit vector there. <clears throat> okay, so there's a formal solution to this equation. This is like a heat equation for the, the operator O alpha. And so you can write the solution for O of alpha as a time-ordered exponential. So you write this as time-ordered exponential of minus integral from zero to alpha of say d theta. So we're sort of integrating over theta up to theta equals alpha, k of theta. <clears throat> like that. Okay, and so this time ordering is time ordering with respect to this angular parameter theta. So we've done this, we've made the the uh, angular rotation our, our orientation of time for this. Um, and so what that means is you expand out this exponential in terms of all the products, and then you make sure to order things um, in angle time order. So it's two operators, k of theta one and theta two are out of order, you just switch them around. That's what this time order symbol means here. So the important thing that simplifies the analysis in um, Rindler space is because so the boost symmetry in Minkowski space corresponds to a rotational symmetry around this plane in Euclidean signature. And so what that implies is that this stress tensor, well, this operator generating the rotation is conserved. And so it's independent actually of alpha. So it's equal to its value on the initial slice. 
So this integral just becomes, you know, you do this integral explicitly. Um, well, yeah, it's it's equal to an integral, but it's just k at zero. So it makes the time ordering trivial as well, because you can just map all of those operators um, to the initial slice. So then you just integrate something, a constant from zero to alpha. And so because of the symmetry, um, this O of alpha then just becomes e to the minus alpha k of zero, say. <laughs> Okay, so that's, we're basically done because now we said the density matrix was computing this going all the way around. So we just set alpha equal to two pi, and that's going to be the answer for our density matrix. Okay, so what, I, yeah, I just said, uh, so that means now rho for the wedge is equal to O of two pi, where we've done the, the full two pi rotation. And then this is equal to E to the minus two pi K. We'll write it as KR. So KR is equal to the integral D so over just the right wedge, so x greater than zero, and then y vector um, d minus two. So d uh, x over this region of x t zero zero. Um, okay. So it's just the integral over the right side of uh, Rindler space on this the Cauchy surface. So this is at t equals zero as well. Okay, so this is kind of the path integral derivation of the, the density matrix for Minkowski space. Um, it's sort of, uh, so this this is sort of something that is, is expected to be valid. Well, it's valid in an interacting theory as well, because you used fairly minimal assumptions. Um, you used that you have this path integral representation um, and that you can, you have a symmetry um, in the rotational space. So that just corresponds to boost symmetry for the theory. Um, and so this can give you an expression for the density matrix that's supposed to hold in an interacting Lorentz invariant theory as well. Um, so how does this relate to the modular operator? Well, this is sort of half of the modular operator in this discussion. The other half you get by doing sort of a similar argument um, for the left Rindler wedge. Um, and if you go through that procedure, you'll just find that it's given similarly by e to the 2 pi KL, where KL is equal to, um, say, minus integral over x less than 0 and everything else the same, dx, x, uh, T zero zero. So the minus is just so that KL is actually the thing generating forward time evolution in the left wedge. <clears throat> and so then the modular operator we said is going to be rho W times rho W prime inverse. And so this is equal to E to the minus two pi KR minus KL which is equal to e to the minus two pi, I'll write it as kc, where this is the full boost generator integrated over the full Cauchy surface. And so this was basically the result that we were trying to show, that um, the boost generator kc gives you the modular operator, by right? so it's sort of the Hamiltonian. The boost generator is the Hamiltonian for which the modular operator is thermal. That's a question. Yeah. Is K bounded for the theorem to apply? If so, what happens in the Lorentzian case? K is the boost operator. Yes. Okay, so um, yeah, K is not, K itself is not bounded. It's more like a Hamiltonian. Um, it's not bounded below either. Um, and that's not necessary for, so in general, this, it has a spectrum of the full real line. Um, and we're going to be discussing that. So the full boost generator is just 
um, unbounded. When we do the one-sided generator, we are thinking of this as being sort of a positive operator, but it's a bit formal because there's issues. The real issue is that we weren't really careful what we're doing right at the corner of the path integral, and that leads to divergences if you're not being super careful about what's going on here. So that's the, the issue with using this as a rigorous proof. Um, but the boost generator itself is uh, doesn't have a sign and it's not bounded. Similarly, we talked before that actually the modular operator itself is also not bounded, but you know, there's technical, it's unbounded, but it's um, the closed unbounded operator. So there's technical requirements that it satisfies that allows you to do modular period. <laughs> So just to, to write out what the modular Hamiltonian is, this was defined as minus log delta omega. Um, and so we see it's equal to two pi times kc. I'm gonna write this as two pi over uh, kappa. So this kappa, so just so this term looks like a surface. Well, this term is, you now would like identify this as the temperature. Um, and I'll explain what kappa is. Yeah, so kappa here is the surface gravity of the vector C that is generating the boost. So kappa is the surface gravity. <clears throat> of the boost generator C. So in this context, we can define that as so, um, by this equation that del A C B is equal to kappa NAB um, at the entangling surface. So at X equals T equals zero. Where N is. Yeah. Uh, so what this means is that um, N is the unit binormal. So there's a, an anti-symmetric uh, unit normal should tensor to the normal plane of this surface. Um, and so then kappa is the constant of proportionality. So C vanishes at this surface, and then its derivative is proportional to the binormal with proportionality constant kappa. Um, this is sort of a property whenever the, the, the vector C is generating a boost right out of surface, it'll always have this kind of being proportional to the binormal. Um, in this context, we basically chose the normalization for C to have unit surface gravity. So in this, for this example, we had kappa equals one. Um, but you can see one thing that the modular operator here sort of doesn't depend on this normalization. So if we rescale C, you end up rescaling kappa by this equation and the modular operator always divides by that. So there's a sense in which the modular operator divides out by the temperature of the Hamiltonian that you're working with. <clears throat> okay. So just a few more comments on this. I wanted to emphasize the inputs to that allowed us to do this. So it's, it's a bit surprising you get a nice local um, expression and it relied on the so the fact that we got a local expression expression for h um, this relied on uh, the modular flow generating a symmetry well the vacuum being uh, invariant under well okay sorry it relied on this K generating the symmetry in Euclidean space. So that, that part came in when we simplified that time-ordered exponential into an ordinary exponential. So it relies on the boost symmetry. Which is rotational symmetry. Um, in the Euclidean space. <clears throat> so in, in situations that it's not symmetric like that, um, the vacuum modular operator, uh, this expression in terms of the, the time-ordered exponential is sort of formally valid, and you could use that to try to do perturbation theory to 
compute these modular operators, but it won't you won't get an exact expression where that time ordered exponential simplifies unless you're able to foliate your path integral by um, the flow of a symmetry. So that's why that occurred in this case. Um, yeah, the final thing um, is that part of the theorem is also determining the modular conjugation. J omega. Um, the way you do this is that you notice from this argument um, that if you take delta omega to the one half, acting on some field phi, say, that's defined on the right wedge, so x, yeah, phi vector, when it's acting on the state omega, you kind of view this as a rotation in Euclidean space, but and when you do like a pi rotation in Euclidean space, it maps it to the operator that's been flipped onto the other side. Um, <clears throat> so you can argue that this maps to phi of minus t minus x and y. Acting on omega three. <clears throat> and so if you remember this s, Omega is supposed to map phi to phi dagger. Um, phi is a Hermitian uh, scalar, so S acting on phi of T is supposed to just give you back phi of T. And so J, what it needs to do, so S is equal to J times delta. Wait, what, I, think, I think you should remind people what S and J are. Yeah, sorry. So S um, is this modular, um, oh, sorry, this Tamita operator. So it's the thing S acting omega A acting. So if A is any operator in the Rindler wedge, S is the thing that implements um, uh, the Hermitian adjoint on that operator. So this delta acting in this way just shows that, um, and yeah, sorry, the, the second thing is that S has this polar decomposition is equal to J omega delta omega to the one half. Sorry, ran a little bit out of space there. So S has this polar decomposition. We just did a computation for the modular operator here. Um, and from that, you can argue that acting on a field T and X, it'll give you a field that's sort of reflected in the T and X plane. So that's going to be something on the left Riddler way. And you need to basically choose J now to undo that reflection um, so that this equation holds because if uh, phi here is going to be a Hermitian scalar. So phi is equal to phi dagger. <clears throat> And so that what you, what that means is you have to have J be an antilinear operator that takes phi of T, X, Y. And when you conjugate by J, um, that this is equal to this T, X reflection. OK? And so again, J will annihilate the, the state omega here. So that's why that works to undo this transformation here. <clears throat> and so the conclusion is that J should look like the CPT operator in this context. So the actual statement is that J psi, J omega, for the Minkowski vacuum research to the Riddler is equal to what we would call CRT. This is the transformation that sends T X to T minus T minus X. The reason you don't call it CPT is normally parity is defined to reflect all of the spatial coordinates. Um, and that can act differently in different dimensions, but in any dimension, this reflection just through to the other side of the Rinsler plane is always sort of well-defined. So it's the transformation that does this and then it sends 
the transverse coordinates to themselves. <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, so this is also part of Bissig Nano Wigman. And in this case, these modular operators and modular conjugations are related to uh, familiar things the boost generator and the CRT operator. Okay, so is there any questions about Bissig Nano Wigman at the moment? Um, okay, so we're going to move on. I'm going to erase the J equals C. I'll put that here. Just so J omega equals C R T. And then we'll use this board for the next topic. <clears throat> so the next thing that we want to talk about is this universal type of local. U of T algebras. <clears throat> so one of the things that this Bissig Nano Wickman theorem does is it gives us a bit of a hint at what the actual type of the algebra is. So we've been discussing different types of von Neumann algebras. Um, and so one thing to note is that for the Riddler wedge, this and the modular operator for the vacuum. It's um it was equal to e to the minus two pi k this boost generator where k is the boost generator and an important thing that was alluded to earlier is that k has a continuous spectrum equal to the full real line. Okay, this is just coming from the fact that it's a non-compact generator in the in the Lorentz group here. Okay, so this is already this is going to be a hint. So now in in basically in order, one of the ways to determine the type of a von Neumann algebra is that you can look at the spectra of the modular operators for all possible states on the algebra. So in this case, we found for the vacuum state. The, the modular Hamiltonian had a continuous spectrum. The point is, though, um, you expect for, say, you create an excited state by acting with some local field operators, you expect any state um, should approach the vacuum in the UV. So when you construct states on top of this Minkowski vacuum, you expect, you know, at short enough distances, you're not changing anything about the state. Um, and so this continuous spectrum, so in particular for things very close to the entangling surface, you expect it to look basically the same as Rindler space. Um, and so you're always going to have something that looks like KR minus KL for the Hamiltonian close to the entangling surface where these guys have unbounded spectra. So when you take the difference, you're just going to get um, continuous spectra. Um, so, you know, you have an arbitrary positive number here, arbitrary negative number here, and then you take differences. So you should expect that any state um, should retain this property of having a continuous spectra. So this is the um, intuitive argument that says um, any state, any modular operator Delta um, should have the continuous spectrum. <clears throat> so delta is e to the minus k, so the, this spectrum is uh, positive real numbers in this case. Okay, so this intersection of all the possible spectra of modular operators. Um, is an important invariant that Kahn identified in the classification of algebras. In the case where all, if you take all of the spectra of the modular operators and you find all of them have a continuous spectrum, that uniquely identifies the algebra as a type 3, 1 algebra. So this property characterizes type 3, 1 algebra. Thank you. 
question um, about compact space. Compact space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So suppose we take Minkowski space and identify by translation through some distance L well, in one direction. So you put it on a circle. Yeah. Okay. Or let's say we do it in all three directions. So space is compact. Does that leave the spectrum continuous? Of the boost. Of the modular. Of, well, you don't have really boost symmetry then? You don't have boost symmetry in that case. Yeah. So then you're not going to necessarily say the vacuum has a nice modular operator in that case. But it's a kind of important that the sh you're, you are thinking of the modular operator very close to the entangling surface. It's not going to know what you're doing in terms of the identification. That's and, why I'm asking. Yeah. But so what's the conclusion then? <laughs> so you should still have the high energy parts of the theory should still look like at short distances that you're in Riddler space. So you still should have a continuous spectrum for this modular operator because it's generating sort of a boost like transformation. It won't, it won't actually be a boost because you know, it's not a symmetry in that case. So the naive expectation that you get an infrared cutoff and it makes like a discrete spectrum for modes, that's not relevant because we're talking about the boost spectrum Correct. Yeah. It's like a redshift. Well, factor uh, sure. Yeah, you can think of it like that. Yeah. 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 So it's important that we're talking about the boost spectrum, not the spectrum of the the global time translation. So on a compact space, that spectrum you probably expect to be discrete, actually. Right. right. Um, and so really, it's in in a quantum field theory, you expect these boost like spectra to be continuous. Um, and so that's like the intuition for the argument. Um, so there are more um, elaborate arguments to try to prove this is the case um, from sort of axiomatic field theories. Usually it involves assuming the theory has some sort of scaling limit and understanding how modular operators for small ball-shaped regions that are kind of near the edge of your, your Rindler wedge behave. Oh yeah, by the way, I mentioned I was going to say something in the Visignano Wickman theorem about how you're actually supposed to prove it. Um, so I can just state that. So what you do in that case um, is that instead of doing this path integral thing, you say you have some correlation functions and you know there's an action of the Lorentz group on those correlation functions. And um, because the global Hamil time translation Hamiltonian is positive, that implies certain holomorphic analyticity properties of those correlation functions. And you essentially use that um, to argue your correlation functions have a, a domain in the complex plane that you can extend the parameters. And you essentially do something where you kind of argue that you can do this thing where you, you do a, a Euclidean two pi rotation or Euclidean pi rotation to map the operators um, into the, the complementary region. Um, and so there's an art, the argument roughly uses those inputs in order to show in the axiomatic framework, why how to prove this thing on a Whitman. We have two questions from the chat. Uh, the first one is that um, oh. is a is about a clarification uh, regarding what you meant by the R operator. Uh, did you just mean a spatial reflection or a space and time re reflection? R is the yeah sorry uh, R is the spatial reflection I might have I might have accidentally said space and time so R is the spatial reflection and T is the time reflection so R T is really what's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second question seems to be along the lines of what Ted just asked uh, whether the modular operator could have continuous spectrum in the UV but not away from the regime it from the UV regime it might have discrete spectrum. Um. Yeah, I think though the U it's because it's sort of the difference of these two positive pieces, you expect both of these things in the UV to have sort of continuous spectrum. And then by taking differences of two positive continuous spectrums, you're going to get the whole real line. So even if the IR is a little bit discrete, um, you're going to fill out all of the real line from these. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, the last thing I'll mention about this universal type, um, I'll just maybe say this quickly. Um, so it's actually even better. So this says that the, the type is expected to be type 3, 1. It's also expected to be hyperfinite. 
Can you remind me what that means? Yep. <laughs> um, so if you recall our cubic construction, this was a, a prototypical example of hyperfinite. In that case, we had a sequence of finite dimensional algebras. So where you truncate your qubits to n qubits, and it was in the limit that you got the, the, the algebra where you take n to infinity. So it's generated by a sequence of finite dimensional subalgebras. That's what it means for an algebra to be hyperfinite. Um, in this case, it, it relates to the split property. One sec, hyperfinite doesn't get indicated by the type notation. It's just an additional property. It's additional. So yeah, in terms of the classification of, of von Neumann algebras, there's actually a really nice thing that happens. So first you do the type one, two, three, then you start trying to, to subclassify. So in particular, say you want to type classify type three factors. The first invariant was this little lambda parameter that we found in the Iraqi Woods construction. That relates to certain, that was the first thing that you could show is an invariant of the algebra. So for every value of that lambda, you get a different algebra. So here we've identified that it's this type three one that corresponded to sort of the chaotic choice of the, the different fiducial lambdas. Um, and then you can say, well, okay, hyperfinite is then another property an algebra can have. And the nice thing about hyperfinite is that you can show, and it's something you can have for these type two as well as type three. And it's actually, in, the classification is that for each of the isomorphism classes, you know, by this, indicated by this number, there's a unique hyperfinite um, algebra, except for the case of type three zero. So then there's a subclassification of the, the hyperfinite ones. But this, what this emphasizes is, is that the local algebras in quantum field theory are expected to be a unique object. They're supposed to uniquely be a type three one hyperfinite factor. Um, and yeah, so the, the way you show this is that you argue that a split, the, the field theory has a split property. Um, maybe say, so the split property roughly means that even though you can't factorize Hilbert's, your, your algebras across a single entangling surface, if you have a situation where, you know, oh, it's a bad drawing, <laughs> say you have regions that are sort of separated by a buffer zone. So you say A is here and B is everything on the outside. Apologize, this is a little small. And there's sort of a buffer zone in between. In this case, the algebra of A and B does factorize. So if you trace out the stuff in the buffer zone, you really get an algebra for B, answer an algebra of A. So this is one way to state the split property. And you can use this um, in the quantum field theory case to argue that these algebras are hyperfinite. You essentially construct type one factors that interpolate between A and then this bigger diamond uh, B complement, B complement, and you use that to construct this uh, sequence of finite dimensional approximations. <clears throat> Somebody's asking, um, what about other type three algebras, not just type three one? Would these not have the property that any state approaches the vacuum? Well, so I don't, I don't know models of them in terms of quantum field theory because they don't have um, the property that the spectrum is uh, uh, continuous in all states. And they similarly, I mean, another way, I should mention another property that type three one has is that this modular automorphism proof where you do, uh, you flow with respect to the modular Hamiltonian, um, it's outer for all values of time, whereas these other type three lambdas, um, it's outer except at very at discrete points along the flow. So there's every so often it'll be generated by something in the algebra. So this is something I, I think it goes, I mean, I think Khan worked all this out in order to classify these type three algebras. So the type three lambda, I don't know of a good physics model necessarily. Um, not to say there isn't one, but yeah, it has certain properties that you don't expect in the quantum field theory case. Right. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, so the next topic that I want to talk about is going to be important uh, when we start uh, constructing gravitational algebras. And so the rest of this lecture will be on sort of arguing for this property. Um, it relates to properties of sort of generic modular flows for subregions in quantum field theory. I'll call this geometric modular flows. <clears throat> okay, so the idea is when we uh, go to gravity, um, we're going to be discussing in the next lecture about how diffeomorphisms in gravity are a gauge transformation. Um, and they, it, oh, wait, can I just stop you for a second? There's yeah. an important oh, okay. kind of question to make sure we're all on the same track. Um, Luca points out type 3 1 has no trace, right? That's one of the yeah, all of the type three algebras have no trace. Right. He says, but we used a trace for the Bisignano Vickman theorem, didn't we? Yes, we did. Yeah. yeah. So would you comment on that? Um, yeah, so we did a bad thing uh, <laughs> uh, because we were cavalier physicists. Um, you might there might be a, a way to justify that kind of thing, possibly using this split property. People usually talk about you know cutting off that singularity at the entangling surface and creating a buffer zone there. And so you might be able to do something where you argue for this geometric property of the of the modular operator um, by doing a sequence of cutoffs so where you're working with type ones um, and then taking a limit. Sorry, was, was that, did I answer the question? What was the question? We used a trace. It seems like we, yeah, so in the argument you gave, which was the physicist path integral argument, yeah. you used a trace. That's true. Okay, but yeah. the algebra you're saying we actually have doesn't have yeah, so yeah, it's possible what you can do is use these type one approximations. Uh, those all have traces and then take a limit. Um, I know there's, yeah, okay. I, I, I don't know if that's the, the form, a formal way to justify that. I know in the hyperfinite case, some of these properties are a lot easier because you can use the, the type one approximations to sometimes uh, to prove things about it. Take a limit. Yeah. Um, apparent, in particular, Longo has a paper talk proving the, the properties of Tomita Takasaki theory in the hyperfinite case, and it's a lot easier it, as far as I can tell. I haven't looked at that though, but just to, to point you to a reference. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so like I said, we're going to be moving to gravity. In gravity, um, we'll be discussing how diffios are gauge. Um, and you sort of have to understand, well, what we're going to be doing is imposing constraints on an algebra that ensures that the, the algebra you constructed is gauge invariant. Um, but what we will want to do is relate the flows that those constraint operators are generating, which are some geometric flows, to modular flows on your algebra, because then you can use some standard constructions um, to get uh, nice algebras at the end of the day. So what this is motivating is it raises the question of what kinds of flows are allowed to be modular flows? Okay. Um, and in particular, when can you relate a geometric flow to the modular flow of some state? So in some sense, if so, if we were living in this type one or two case, Um, the answer is pretty trivial. It's just that uh, thermal, you know, modular being the property of being a modular Hamiltonian just means that you have a state that's thermal with respect to it. So it's pretty much anything can be a modular flow in that case. So what does that mean? Say you just have some Hamiltonian H in your algebra, say it's a positive operator, whatever it is, let's just form a density matrix rho that's thermal with respect to this at some temperature beta, and then normalize it. Okay, if you do this, then rho to the minus is um, over beta, this generates a flow. And in this case, you can, okay, so this flow, so you take A goes to AS, which equals, uh, yeah, let's write it as uh, 
row to the IS over beta, A row to the IS over beta, minus IS, IS. Um, so doing this uh, ensures that the correlation functions in the state defined by this density matrix are thermal. Sorry, correlation functions in time only? I'm gonna write some equations. <laughs> yeah. Well, because I thought you just finished telling us that quantum field theory is always not type. Yep. Because so well, I'm just saying that region. this would be easy if it, if we weren't in the type three case. So I'm saying what in these cases what flows are modular flows. But flow on what space? You have an an algebra of operators. No, but geometry of what space? It's the heading just, is geometric modular flows. Yeah, but what's not, the geometry? I'm setting up. <laughs> there's no geometry yet. I'm just saying what operators can be modular Hamiltonians is the question, really. Let's answer the question: which operator can be a modular Hamiltonian? Okay. Um, so we're doing we're answering that question in the type one slash two case because it has an easy answer there. <clears throat> So the state defined by this density matrix is you just take correlation functions uh, with the density. Well, you take a trace with the density matrix inserted, um, and you can actually show it satisfies a KMS condition. So we mentioned this briefly um, in the discussion of modular theory, but so really what this says is if you take this uh, a sub s b correlation function in the state rho. So A sub s is just your evolving with respect to this Hamiltonian H. This is equal to trace of rho um, so e to the i s h a e to the minus i s h b. <clears throat> and then you're just going to use cyclicity of the trace. So you write this because so, because rho is just e to the minus beta h up to normalization, you write this as e to the um, ish minus beta h a, and then we do e to the minus ish plus beta h e to the minus beta h b. So these ones just cancel out, and then we just cyclically permute everything. So then this looks like the density matrix row. So now we cyclically permute everything and then take this to be the density matrix. So this is going to be trace row times B and then everything here. So this is A at the value of S plus I theta. Okay, so this is B A at S plus I theta. Okay. So here, this is this KMS condition that we, we talked about before. Um, what it says is that, oh, sorry, this is should be an S. What it says is that this correlation function B times A of Z is uh, holomorphic in a strip between zero and I beta. So it's, you first write it as a function of S, you show that it can be analytically continued to a holomorphic function in the strip. And its value at the top part of the strip at i data is related to the same correlation function at zero with the operators reverse. And this is sort of this is a correct derivation of that fact in these type one and type two cases. Um, you just have to worry about everything converging in the middle, and so this argument is valid um, basically up to the to beta to you know, this complex parameter becoming beta, and then you have to worry about convergence. And so this is sort of a continuous, continuum way of characterizing your state being thermal. <clears throat> okay, the other thing that's kind of trivial is that um, the correlation functions are time translation invariant in this state as well. Um, just because again, you can use cyclicity to move these H's around, and then rho is proportional to h, so that cancels out. So these are time 
translation invariant. This is an additional condition as part of like the KMS condition. I think you call this the KMS condition, and then you would call this time translation invariant. Sometimes maybe you would put them both together. I, I would say maybe it's most correct to call this the KMS condition by itself. Um, and then this is a, a separate condition. Together, if you put them together, sometimes this is called the modular condition. So that this flow is being modular. Um, why is that the case? Because if, if you have a state that satisfies and a flow that satisfies these two conditions, the, so KMS and uh, translation invariant with respect to the flow, um, this basically guarantees that your state, this flow is a modular flow for th this state. <clears throat> yeah, so this implies um, rho to the IS generates modular flow of the state. Big expectation value in the state row. <clears throat> so then you could do a similar argument for the commutant piece. And so you can break down in this case the modular operator as just the product of the two density matrices. So in this case, if you were representing all of these things on the Hilbert space, you just give me two density matrices, a left and a right Hamiltonian. Um, and so if I change this flow to be, gen be generated by like rho times rho prime inverse, where this is in the commutant, it'll just pass through anything so that doesn't affect it. And so if you just define delta to be rho, rho prime inverse, um, this is going to be the modular operator for the state that would, you would get on the global Hilbert space for this. And so the important thing is that these two conditions guarantee the existence of um, a state for which this is the modular flow. Can I ask a yeah. really elementary question? So suppose we're just doing quantum mechanics. <laughs> uh, we write the row is just the thermal density matrix. <laughs> But then what is rho prime in that case? Like if it's a harmonic oscillator, what's the you have to purify your system. So you say it, this density matrix came from pure state for some purification. So then you specify the density matrix for that. So I don't under so are you saying when you jump from the right board here to the left board where you wrote that equation? Yeah, uh, I'm saying pure system. You can invent uh auxiliary system such that you can define a lambda delta such that it's equal to this. Yeah, and in that case, so in the finite dimensional case, modular theory relies on these cyclic separating properties. You need your, your purification to have the same dimension basically, um, just to satisfy that. So you need to do some sort of canonical purification where you're just taking a sec second copy. That should sound like thermophile double to you a bit if you're familiar with that. Um, and then you can do this. But is that a logical part of what you said on the right hand board that rho to the IS generates a modular flow? Is that so I mean, this is, uh, you can do everything. Yeah, let me think. I mean, these to me to talk, these modular operators are always defined on a global Hilbert space. When you want to work just at the level of states, roughly this is the modular condition. So you can do everything just at the level of states here. Um, you know, you don't have the J's and stuff like that, but you just define this to be the modular condition. You can show that the thing generating this is unique. Um, and then you can do a lot of the modular theory there. Okay, so the question is, um, oh yeah. And so then your modular operator here will just be like, you know, rescaled by the inverse temperature this H minus whatever H you picked for the density matrix on the commutant. Actually, there's a question yeah. probably worth addressing right now because it's kind of orientation question. Uh -huh. Is it correct to say that only thermal states have modular operators in the type one and type two von Neumann algebras? Essentially, there are no other cyclic separating states other than the thermal state for type one and two? Well, um, let's see. 
So for every cyclic separate state, separating state, there is an operator in the type one and two case that that, that state is thermal with respect to. Um, and so, yeah, it's only thermal states, but I'm allowed to use anything as the Hamiltonian is the idea. Well, actually, that's the second question that just popped up. Anything as the Hamiltonian? Were there any conditions on H? I would have um, thought it has to be positive. Or I think it needs it on one side. I think it needs to be positive. Um, you probably want to worry about it being trace class as well. So you want to make sure that this correlation function, this argument actually has a good analytic continuation. So you there, there can be some conditions on row being trace class. You can even probably get away with taking things that are not trace class. It's just you might end up with what's known as a weight instead of a state. Um, and those are things that are finite on a lot of stuff, but not on everything. So they can blow up on certain operators. Um, and actually, the whole modular theory does work very well for weights. Um, we encountered like, an example of a weight when we talked about the trace on the type 1 factor. So that thing blows 1 infinity. That thing blows up on the identity. That's a, an example of a weight. <clears throat> OK, so what is what is wrong with this argument in quantum field theory? Well, okay, you probably guessed it. It's because we really use this trace and this factorization of the modular operator. So what changes? For type three. Well, OK, so you can't do this legally because there's no trace um, and the, the factorization no longer holds. But is there any analog of this uh, universality for the class of modular operators. So I just said the, the allowed conditions for a modular Hamiltonian in the one and two case is that there's a lot of them. You most, you know, it has to satisfy certain positivity conditions. So in the case of quantum field theory, okay, I don't know the exact answer, but the idea is that we want to use this intuition for what look going close to the entangling surface, what the modular flow is doing. The idea is that close to the entangling surface in a region in quantum field theory, um, the, the theory really shouldn't. So you have some entangling surface, okay, um, and you, sorry, this is like a spatial region, and then you zoom into an entangling surface. The theory should not know that it's basically, you know, it should look like Rindler space. So if I zoom in, it should just look like a Rindler light cone in the transverse direction. Um, and so the idea is the constraint in type three, the reason things weren't factorizing and all of that is that it just has to look like the vacuum near the entangling surface. And otherwise, away from the entangling surface, the flow is largely unconstrained. So, okay, we expect modular flows in QFT to look like the boost near um, an entangling surface. So the proposal is, um, as long as so you could pick an arbitrary Hamiltonian generating a flow on a time slice, and as long as you are careful about what it's doing right at the entangling surface, um, then that should define a good state for where you can have a KMS condition according to these arguments. So the idea is, um, so pick sort of Cauchy surface for a subregion, here, do a subregion like this, and then pick a vector C that approaches one of these boost vectors here. So CA at the boundary, at the boundary of sigma is equal to zero. And we'll do this condition that it has constant surface gravity. So del A of CB is equal to kappa NAB. So this is this condition that it is uh, preserving the null planes in the normal direction, right at the boundary. Um, and this should define 
So the Hamiltonian for this should be a valid modular Hamiltonian is the proposal. So this HC, so again, you want to extend this to the complementary region so that you're evolving backwards over here. Be a valid modular Hamiltonian. So in particular, that there should be a state such that the modular Hamiltonian is equal to two pi over kappa times HC, where this is the, the coefficient that we fix basically from this local physics on a Wigman argument, or let's say the, the unroot temperature locally near the, the surface. <clears throat> so some aspect of this conjecture um, contained in it is a proposed zero flaw for modular flow. So zero flaw. We actually want this kappa to be constant. On the entangling surface. Um, and I think you can argue for this sort of by thinking about what different values of kappa would mean um, for the local Riddler space if you did the analytic continuation to Euclidean space. Roughly, kappa tells you how quickly you're flowing, rotating around the surface, and it, it relates to the periodicity in Euclidean space. Um, for the, the flow to come back to itself. And so it's basically by picking there to be no conical singularity in this local Euclidean evolution, you would have to argue that this kappa basically is constant along the entangling surface. So you're, you're, this is a property you're going to restrict C if HC has a chance of being a valid modular Hamilton. Yeah, the proposal is that it should set it, it should have this property that kappa is I don't think, I mean, I, I know exactly what you're talking about because we've talked about it, but <laughs> for the sake of everybody in the mini course, I mean, I think you should pause and explain conceptually what the issue is here. Like you're asking, you, you're inverting the situation. So now you're starting with a geometric flow on a space time in a quantum field theory, how it acts on the fields. And you're asking, does there exist a state so that this flow is the modular flow of that state. Mm. It's kind of an right. unnatural question a priori. Oh yeah, so I mean, it's unnatural. So yeah, why are we, I guess I haven't told you why we're even trying to do that, but yeah, the question is, okay, the vacuum, for example, will probably not have this property except for very symmetric setups. And I'm saying, well, maybe not the vacuum, but some sort of, excited state that looks thermal, a bit thermal, um, will have this property that the flow generated on this, this geometric flow is generated by some Hamiltonian, and you can construct a thermal state with respect to that Hamiltonian. And I'm saying that it should be a modular Hamiltonian for these local regions, as long as it's looking like the, the vacuum modular Hamiltonian close to the entangling surface, where you can't tell the difference from the vacuum, basically. Um, ultimately, we want to use these states in order to argue that these geometric flows in the context of gravity um, are related to modular flows on your quantum fields, and that'll be useful for constructing these crossed products going forward. I don't know if that gives you the, a good intuition, but yeah, we're just asking, can you have a geometric modular flow um, generically? And so how am I getting around, this? the second point is how am I getting around this point that we relied on the rotational symmetry in the vacuum um, for the Rintler wedge in order to get the geometric modular flow? Then the second point is that it's geometric at an instant in time. So it's geometric at an instant in time. So what I mean by that is that it will infinitesimally generate time translations of this vector near the initial Cauchy surface. But because this C is not a symmetry of the background or the region that you're talking about generically, um, this, this Hamiltonian is not conserved under that flow. So the geometric flow would be some time dependent 
generated by a time dependent Hamiltonian where this really is changing because it's not conserved. Whereas I'm saying just pick the value at the initial slice and flow with respect to that. Um, it's not going to coincide with the geometric flow away from the, the initial surface, but initially it is generating this time translation. And that's sort of the, in gravity, we're going to be imposing a constraint on that surface. And so that's how we're going to argue that this is an okay to, thing to do. Yeah, one more thing. Um, the first I heard of this is in your paper, this idea of asking this question even. Okay. Is it, did it exist elsewhere? And if not, I, would direct people to the place to read about it? So, I mean, the basic idea that modular flows should look like boosts near entangling surface has been, it's like a folklore of sorts. I don't know who came up with it, but it's something people often say and try to make precise in various contexts. Um, so we're trying to take that intuition and maybe make a more precise proposal in order to use it in the context of the, these gravitational algebras. Right, and um, your, your paper listed on the reading material for the course is the one in which this is the detailed formulation of this. We, yeah, we good. spell out, we state this, and then, uh, yeah, in this in this paper on the in the course materials, we'll state this and give some arguments for it. Um, and so we're going to go through as many arguments as we have time for today. Um, but the, yeah, we started a little late, but <laughs> yeah, you have like five minutes left. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to say the argument that I like about this, that I like for this. We have a couple others in this, this paper that's listed on the course material. <clears throat> okay, so this converse of the co-cycle derivative Theorem. Okay, I mentioned this briefly on the discussion of modular theory. Um, the cocycle derivative theorem is asking actually the opposite question of what we're asking here. Cocycle derivative theorem says if you have two states psi and phi, um, it's asking how are the modular flows. related. And so this is this famous work by Kahn that showed that the two modular flows are related by inner automorphism. So that there's one way to state that is that the modular Hamiltonian per psi um, can be written as A plus H phi plus B prime, where A is an element of the algebra, B prime is an element of the commutant algebra, Okay, they should probably be self-adjoint, um, but otherwise uh, for generic A and B, um, this, this, these two uh, modular Ham Hamiltonians are related like this. And so it's usually stated at the level of the modular flow and then the two flows are related by what are known as um, con co-cycles. The converse theorem is that it goes the other way as well. Say you started with a modular Hamiltonian and you perturbed it by something in A and something in B prime, preserving you know, hermeticity. Um, that means there, it guarantees that you there is a state of the perturbed Hamiltonian for which this is a modular uh, Hamiltonian. So it's sort of the, the co-cycle derivative theorem goes both ways. Um, there's certain technical requirements, and actually it's probably important that the thing you're guaranteed is known as a faithful semi-finite normal weight. So we ran into those terminologies in our discussions of traces. Um, and it's probably important that you're not necessarily guaranteed a normalizable state, but you're guaranteed something that's like an unnormalized state. It might blow up on some of the elements of the algebra, but it's finite on enough of the algebra to generate the full algebra. So that was this semi-finite property that we talked about with traces as well. You can use those for weights. 
So the idea here is that say you started with a generic modular Hamiltonian, um, say for the vacuum, maybe you did this path integral construction to write it as a very complicated multi-local integral of the stress tensor. You figured out what it was. Um, the goal is if you can show that you can cancel all the non-local pieces in the, that modular operator that you, or modular Hamiltonian that you found by things in the algebra, um, then you're guaranteed that the new thing that is now basically the integral of a single stress tensor, um, essentially this guy that we were proposing, the integral of the stress tensor weighted by C, um, you would say that that's kind of the only thing left because you need at least something here at the corner generating the boost. And so the argument is as long as you could show something like that, you're guaranteed that this new state is a modular Hamiltonian. So I would say this is maybe evidence, possibly a way to think about a possible proof of this conjecture. Um, but yeah, so I kind of like this because this sort of reflects the, the universality of modular flows. So we found in the type one and type two case, we could add sort of anything to, we could choose kind of anything up to again, the, the hermeticity properties. Um, in that case, type one and type two, the identity can be a modular operator. And so then you just say, you know, or zero, I guess. So yeah, so log of the identity is zero. And so if you throw that away in the type one and type two case, we recover that universality. So all of this is saying is that you need one piece that's doing the outer automorphism part, and then everything else is kind of also a modular flow. Okay, we're close to the end. Um, I wanted to maybe mention a few other situations. We're we are uh, four minutes over 2.15. Okay, I'll say this. I'll just say this in words. Um, there's some cases where you can show this zero flaw, which I just I erased at some point in a non-trivial case. Um, there's a really interesting recent work by uh, uh, Cudler, Glam, uh, Lloyd Moser, and uh, Satishandran, who looked at things like Schwarzschild de Sitter, um, and they found a version of these geometric modular flows by working on the killing horizons and they see there's a way to interpret what they did as kind of rescaling you know their initial flows have different temperatures different surface gravities and you can kind of see how the modular flow gets rescaled in that case so but it's kind of a nice verification of the zero flaw at least that's how i would interpret what they found in that are you saying it's also it's a special case of what you're trying to argue for. I would say it's a special case where they they actually know the state. They know they state. find they find a, a factorized state, and this factorization lets them show something like the zero flaw. Um, we have another argument in the paper where I just should mention. So, if for ball shaped regions in conformal field theories, there's an analog of this bizarre Wickman theorem called the theorem of Hislop and Longo. There's also a really nice, re more recent work. I mean, it's about over 10 years old now by Cassini, Huerta, and Myers that explains this using more um, familiar conformal field theory techniques. And so there you can show that the ball-shaped regions in conformal field theories have geometric flows as well. And then you can try to do conformal perturbation theory on top of that. And so we have a discussion in our paper talking about how that conformal perturbation theory works and arguing that the geometric modular flow also can be verified in that case. Okay, and just to conclude on what this is, this is a conjecture, but it's also an interesting question because it's a purely quantum field theoretic conjecture. So if you were interested, it's something about quantum field theory that doesn't really necessarily rely on assumptions about quantum gravity. So you can, in principle, investigate it in the context of axiomatic field theory. Um, there's various questions like, are there other restrictions on the, the vector besides this zero flaw that we're, we're proposing? Also, do, can you show that this zero flaw necessarily has to hold, or is there something else? Um, it would be nice to have explicit examples with like less symmetry than, say, these causal diamonds in, in perturbation theory. Particularly, you'd like to understand that whether the geometry of the entangling surface matters. Um, and maybe another example is like you could possibly make some progress on this in free field theory where there's certain explicit expressions for modular operators. Okay, so we'll stop for today. The goal for next week is to move now away from the quantum field theory for a bit and just to talk about gravity and constraints. 
And then ultimately, sort of probably half of Wednesday and then Friday, we'll be talking about the construction of the gravitational algebras, cross products, and uh, all sorts of, okay, eventually generalized entropy. Okay, so we'll stop and take questions. Great, thank you. See a question here? What is it? Could you comment on the units of the flow given some region? Which, yeah, I'm not sure which flow. Um, I think you should clarify that you're picking a flow and then you're asking a question whether any old flow subject to the surface gravity being constant, for example, has a corresponding state. <clears throat> Yeah, so we're there is there is a uniqueness first of all. So you you pick a region and then you have an algebra of operators there. There is a uniqueness that so then you consider states on that. And there's a uniqueness theorem that if you find a flow that satisfies this time translation invariance and KMS, um, there's a unique state or technically a weight that where that's the modular flow. And then obviously, whenever you have a state, um, the modular theory tells you that there is a flow with respect to that state that is modular and time translation invariant. Um, so that's that was the Tomito Takasaki theory. Um, so that's the sense in which it, so there's kind of a correspondence between certain flows and states. Um, the, the other thing that maybe is worth mentioning, it's related to this time dependence here. The flow really has to be. Um, e to the i s of h, where this is a fixed operator. So there's a certain, in particular, it has to be, it has to kind of say, you know, e to the i s h, e to the i t h has to equal e to the i s plus t h. Okay, it has to have this homomorphism property. For time dependent flows, they won't satisfy this. So you need to have your flow essentially satisfy this. It's probably related to the time time invariance of the correlation functions as well. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if that answered the question, but just to clarify. And so, yeah, we're looking, we're saying fix a region, take a flow and ask whether that is the modular flow of a state. At one time, actually, that's all you're asking, right? Well, we're saying the flow is the flow generated by the Hamiltonian, um, and it's a geometric flow at an instant in time. Yeah. There could be other modular flows, by the way, that are not geometric, you know, globally within the ball at any time. Um, you know, you could just perturb it by some sort of multi-local operator here, and it'll just kind of mix everything up. Um, but it still should approach something that looks boost-like and approximately geometric close to the entangling surface. There are uh, two questions that uh, were saved for this discussion section. Uh, Krishna Jalan, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, hi, I uh, just wanted to confirm something. So uh, the uh, flow that you're talking about, like uh, I could pick up any open region and I could define a modular flow with respect to the vacuum, right? Yes. So, like, uh, why do what is an entangling surface for such an open region? Like, why do I need an entangling surface for that? Oh, the, I think the entangling surface normally you associate these algebras with uh, causally complete regions. So, if you yeah. started with like a random Am I still, is the camera on me over here? Or, yeah. Okay. If you started with a random open region, yes. um, the actual algebra that is generated by operators in that region are sort of this causal, causally complete region. So first you take U prime is the set of all stuff that's like space-like separated from you. And then this, this diamond here is the, the causal completion. So you call that, um, U double prime. So these are all this operator space like that se separated from U prime. And so those types of regions have these kind of co-dimension two. So surface. you are talking about the uh, like the boundary of that the causally complete region that is the entangling surface. Yes, right here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and just uh, one more question. So uh, when it's a geometric flow, uh, are you trying to say that uh, 
when the action of the modular flow becomes local is what you're trying to see. Yeah, and local at an instant in time. So for operators localized on kind of a Cauchy surface, it should generate instantaneously time translation for them. Okay. And we're saying there's a class, we're arguing there is, is a class of uh, modular Hamiltonians that do that. And really what it, the important point is that it looks like a boost. So it looks like this boost translation at the entangling surface. So the conditions provided by uh, Cassini, Vuerta, and Myers, those are the sufficiency, con sufficiency conditions for such a modular flow to be a geometric flow as well. Right? Yeah, and it's also important for most of the, for most of these, you know, things like in Cassini, Vuerta, Myers, they find a flow that's actually geometric throughout the causal diamond, and it's because okay. they're working with a conformal killing vector in a conformal field theory. It's generating a symmetry of the theory. Um, and so it sort of generates this dip times vial transformation in that case. Um, but yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, there were also two other questions in the chat. Priyanka, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Um, okay, I'll take that as a as a no. But uh, in that case, I'll ask the question anyway. Um, so in in the talk you uh, earlier, you uh, said that since the spectrum of the modular Hamiltonian is continuous for quantum field theories, that you conclude that it is type 3, 1. Yeah. Are there cases where the algebra is not type 3, for example, a discretized lattice, uh, but where a modular Hamiltonian spectrum can also be continuous? Yeah, I think. So basically, this argument I gave, you could pick, um, you could pick like in a type one infinity case. We need it to be type one infinity because otherwise, you know, you don't have continuous spectrum in finite dimensions. Um, just pick two Hamiltonians for the right and left region that have a generic discrete spectrum, you know, kind of chaotic. The modular operator is the difference of those two spectrums. So as long as there's no relations between them, generically you're going to get a continuous spectrum. The statement that it's type 3, 1 is that every modular operator has a continuous spectrum. So in the, the finite or the type 1 case, you can pick a Hamiltonian that has a you know harmonic oscillator spectrum. It's discrete with equal spacing. If both of them have that, then you have a modular operator that just has a discrete spectrum. And so the statement is in the type three one case, you cannot do that. All of the modular operators have continuous spectrum. And is then there there's question? a question oh, by Claire in the chat. Um, uh, Claire, do you wanna ask your question? Um, sure, just a very simple question. Are there applications for the not type three one algebras that fall in the type, like within type three for the other type three algebras that are not type three one? So applications for these like type three lambda algebras, is that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know on, off the top of my head. Um, uh, yeah, it's okay, so we have, an explicit qubit construction where you, so, you know, if you took that to be a physical system, I mean, it's a, a, a lattice system of qubits, uh, it's something that you could do. Um, I don't know in quantum field theory or quantum gravity any applications of the type 3 lambda, but it's not to say that there might not be something interesting there. Um, I think this point where the you can show that this modular flow is actually an inner automorphism for kind of discrete regularly spaced times might be a hint at where this type of thing might show up. Like if you did a quantum field theory, you did, I mean, we're gonna be talking about cross product, but you could do some sort of other cross product where you could ensure that the modular flow is just uh, inner at, at discrete times. So you might see that showing up and uh, say, okay, if, if I can argue that's an interesting system, then you're saying I'm working with one of these type three lambdas. It just reminded me of, low K systems that condensed matter people are into these days. Okay. I don't they they drive the yeah. system with a periodic external. The time crystals or pardon? Like the time crystals or? Well, that, no, not necessarily, but that might be an example. Yeah, the systems where the Hamiltonian, I guess, has a periodic time dependent term in it. 
Oh, okay. And they create apparently very interesting phenomenology and phenomena that might even be useful in condensed matter physics, but they okay. create systems with unusual behavior that way. Okay, yeah. So yeah, short answer is they don't know an explicit use of it, but it's good to keep in mind some of these properties that they have just in case you're you know, doing some analysis and you identify this property that it looks out or except at discrete times or something, then maybe you can say it's type three lambda and okay, that can help simplify your life. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the question. I'm wondering about the applicability of this of this argument that the local algebras are type three one to effective field theories, uh, like. Um, uh, Okay. Gravitational field theory, uh, field theory around a background. Uh, uh, do you have any uh, reason to expect? Not that the type is necessarily type three one, but the type three one algebras are, e even if quantum fields are on a background, are a meaningful thing to consider in the gravitational case. Uh, well, okay. There's quantum fields on a background versus also. There's another question of well, I don't know if you're referring to. Just generic Quantum fields, including gravity. Yeah. So yeah, the thing we're going to be talking about in these lectures, we are including gravitons, but we're taking a limit where they're going to be decoupled and free. Um, there's a question of how you incorporate the order by order corrections to that description. Um, in the Witten original cross product paper, you talked a lot about this formal power series in one over n, um, and it does raise a lot of questions on okay. You're working in this power series in one over n. How do you relate that to an actual these theorems you want to use from von Neumann algebras, which are not defined as formal power series? Um, I know, um, okay, just because I'm at UIUC, Tom Bogner has been doing a bunch of stuff that I think is one way to interpret that in terms of these, uh, he calls it isometrically uh, or asymptotically isometric codes. And it's trying to use these type one approximation ideas. Um, and using those to describe it. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of a good open question, like how to actually interpret this perturbative in one over n picture or the standard effective field theory where you're doing per perturbations in an energy scale um, and that kind of thing. So yeah, in, in general, I don't know the answer, but it's a good question. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, probably any other questions? I don't think so. Oh, okay. Okay. So, yeah, thanks, and we'll see everyone on Monday.